Well, good afternoon, Iowa. That's pretty pitiful. Good afternoon, Iowa. Been a remarkable morning, hasn't it? My goodness, I had the opportunity this morning to sit down with your new superintendents and their board chairs and see the excitement and some of the incredible things that are going on across the great state of Iowa. And I came into this very ballroom and standing about where I am now, uh, some little cherub came up and sung the Star Spangled Banner like I've not heard very often before. Would you agree with me that that little girl was pretty incredible? Then I got to sit back, and if I was in Atlanta, Georgia, I would have thought I was at the Fox Theater as I listened to that high school jazz band and them laying down a beat. And, and all I could think of as I sat out in, the, out in the audience is something that I've thought of often over the last 27 years. And that is, where are the talk show radio hosts and the editorialists and the politicians who tell us that our schools in this country are declining and they're just no good. They need to spend more time seeing things like we saw this morning. You know, I've gotten an opportunity. I was here in 2012 and got to meet a number of you, and I've gotten to spend some time with you today. Um, rather than thinking me, of me as that Georgia guy, can I suggest to you that maybe you give me the honor of calling me a distant cousin? <laughs> because I grew up over the river in the state of Wisconsin, 30 miles north of Green Bay as a seventh generation dairyman's son. And when I stepped outside this morning after that first general session and I felt that wind coming from the west hit me in the face, I remembered why I moved to Georgia. <laughs> you know, people often ask me, said, did you put a lot of thought into moving from Wisconsin to Georgia? What a change. What in the world brought you from Wisconsin to Georgia? And it's really not a very deep story. I'm the youngest of three children, growing up on a dairy farm, and the old man always told me, he said, when I get you graduated, I'm moving somewhere warm. So when I got out of high school and went off to the University of Wisconsin, my mother and my dad moved down near Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is. And I remember that first winter. It was time to go home for Christmas. And I loaded up my little car in Wisconsin, and it was 20 below on the thermometer, and I think it was 50 below wind chill. And my little Ford Escort and I made our way down to Athens, Georgia. And as I drove through Athens, all of the co-eds were in t-shirts and it was 70 above. And I got to my parents' house and I picked up the phone. This is before cell phones. And I called my roommates and I said, I'm not coming back. <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, and I've been down in Georgia uh, with the possible exception of a couple years that I was superintendent in Bozeman, Montana ever since. But what an honor it is to be with you today. Let's talk a little bit about what our time together today is going to be and what our time together today is not going to be. First of all, what today is not going to be is let me show you how well we did things in our particular school district and if you would just do stuff like we do it, your schools would get better. I know better than that. Iowa has some of the best schools in the nation and you ought to be proud of that. And And furthermore, let me suggest you, and if there's a couple of takeaways from today, this might be one of them, that anybody in this complex world, in this complex space that we work in education that comes to you and starts with something like, all you've got to do is fill in the blank and your schools will get better, I would suggest that you listen to them with great skepticism. There are very few, all you have to do is fill in the blank and your schools will get better. So today will not be a recipe where if you'll just do these three things, everything will be wonderful. You'll have Lake Wobegon and your schools will be wonderful. What I hope today is, is an opportunity for you to see me, Will Schofield, how we've worked within the Hall County School District because I tell people this all the time. I am a disciple and a husband and a dad way before I'm a school superintendent. And something within me gnaws 
it gnaws at me and it says, if we're not careful, ladies and gentlemen, we being our generation, those of us that are blazing the trail for the next generation, we may be known as the first generation of Americans in the history of this country that leave fewer opportunities for our children than were left for us. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be part of that generation. So as we talk today, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is, is kind of look from that 30,000 foot level. By the way, you school board members, how many school board members in the audience today? I think I've got a pretty good idea. And how many would be district administrator types? Wow, we're really outnumbered. <laughs> kind of reminds me of a story, by the way. On a bright, sunny Saturday morning, a boy was sitting at the table with his mother, and he said, Mama, I'm not going back to school on Monday. And she said, Son, what are you talking about? I said, I'm just not going back to school on Monday. She said, Why not? I said, Mom, you just don't understand. The kids don't like me. The teachers don't like me. The principal sure doesn't like me. And she put her arm around the, the, the son and said, boy, you're the superintendent of schools. Quit complaining and go back to work. <laughs> so, those of you that raised your hand as the administrators know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I recently had an opportunity to spend some time at the University of North Georgia. It's one of the few military colleges left uh, in our country with a gentleman named General James Terry. Now, I've talked to some people in this audience today. Some of, some of you are superintendents in two school districts at once. It gave me a headache thinking about that. Uh, but General James Terry is the individual who's in charge of defeating ISIL in Iraq and Syria. Think your job is complicated? I think my job is complicated. This gentleman's job is complicated. And one of the things that General Terry suggested to the group of us that was with him was that we've moved in a world that goes way beyond complicated to a world that is complex. For Terry said, back when we lived in a world that was complicated, he said, you know what an individual would do? They'd gather facts. They'd make sure they had all of their stakeholders on board. They'd make a lot of phone calls. They'd see what people had done in similar situations in the past, and then they'd make a decision. And with great certainty, they could be assured that if they worked their strategic plan, good things would happen. That is what life looked like when we lived in a complicated world. Terry suggests that as we've moved into this complex world, it requires a whole different kind of leadership. And when it comes to leadership within our public schools, it's the individuals sitting in this room. It's boards of education. It's district administrators. It's community leaders. Everywhere I go, every group of people that I talk to, I lift up local school board members as probably the greatest example we have left in this country of representative democracy. It's incredible. But back to this complex world. Terry said, now we live in a world where you can gather information. You can look at the past, as we did this morning, looking at some of the lessons learned from the Battle of Gettysburg. Said you can get consensus and you can get everybody, or at least eight out of 10 around the table to agree on a course of action. But before you take your very first step, the variables change. And all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're fighting enemies we didn't even know existed the day before. Sound at all like work in the public schools? As an example, Terry said, I got to Afghanistan back during the war. And they told us to win a war in Afghanistan. He said, in one of the first weeks that I was there, we came across a poppy field. And everybody in this audience knows what a poppy field is. You harvest poppy seeds, you distill it, and you create heroin, you create opium. He said, I'd never seen a poppy field before. But I asked my lieutenants, I said, what is this field out here? And they said, well, General, that's a poppy field. He said, poppy as in opium, as in heroin that ends up in the streets of Chicago, that ends up in the streets of Des Moines, that ends up in the streets of Atlanta? He said, exactly. He said, so I didn't think I needed to do a lot of checking on that. 
I said, burn it. He said, we burned a poppy field. He said, within 24 hours, we had bullets whizzing all around us, people shooting at us, and we sent out the world's best intel, and they came back within six hours, and they said, General, it's not the Taliban that's shooting at you. It's local farmers and their families. He said, for you see, for generations, those individuals had put sandals on the feet of their children and bought their food by growing poppies and selling them to the highest bidders. He said, I got the greatest lesson that day in the fact that the world that we live in, educators, the world that we live in, mom and dads, the world that we live in, policymakers, is one that is complex. And it does not lend itself to solutions that begin with, all you have to do is fill in the blank. So our time today, by the way, this technical crew over here is incredible, but I told them, I said, people don't generally trust me with a clicker, so you're, this, is, this is really something for me. I usually, I usually get to hold the clicker. Uh, if there weren't 1,800 people here, I'd play with it a little bit, but I don't usually get to hold the clicker. Let me tell you a little bit about the district that, that I come from, going into my 11th year with the Hall County School District, which, by the way, is relatively unusual. Middle and large districts, superintendents, tenure in this country now averages 2.8 years. Um, make me a case for how you make meaningful, positive change in a school district when you're changing your leader every two and a half years. And I'd, and I'd like to hear that, but that's a conversation for another day. Let me describe what our district looks like. We've got 28,000 kids. About two-thirds of them come to us every day from homes of poverty. Um, half of our kids are minority. And that 20% is really low. It's closer to about a quarter of our kids uh, within our schools do not have English as their primary language. They're English language learners. And 11 years ago, if you would have visited the Hall County School District, what you would have seen is a network of 33 schools. Everybody was assigned to schools based on their address. And all of the elementary schools basically taught the same thing. All of the middle schools basically taught the same thing. And all of the high schools had the same offerings. Can I suggest you now as a takeaway, a second takeaway, that this beautiful idea that we have in this country of the common school, you know, isn't it incredible as we look around the world and we make comparisons with other nations that we are one of the few that take all comers? Give us your tired, give us your poor, give us your special needs, give us your children that don't speak the English language. We take all comers. And I think that's just a beautiful thing. But as a second takeaway, let me suggest to you that if it is one of our primary goals at the beginning of the day in public education to make sure every kid gets exactly the same thing, that treating unequals equally is inherently unequal. And you'll have to let that one sink in a little bit. So one of the things that we said is with a district of 28,000 students, 33 schools, with all that was going on, we were spending a third of a billion dollars a year. And we came to the conclusion that we had an obligation to try to figure out if we wanted to try to do some things differently. You know, it was 12 years ago, and I got on an airplane, I flew into Atlanta, and I rented a car, got a speeding ticket. My wife still reminds me of that. Drove up to Gainesville, Georgia, and I applied, I interviewed for this position that I currently have. And you all, most of you have been through that, hopefully not very many times. And the school board, my board president, who's with me, Nace Morris, been serving as board, on the Board of Education for 15 years. We got all done, and we were trying to decide whether or not we wanted to go steady. And, and they got to that point where the school board got to say to me, do you have any questions for us? And I said, really, just one. And they said, really, what's your question? And it was five board, board members. I said, are you folks willing to try to do some things differently? Are you willing to take a look at school, at how we use resources, at how we use time, at how we assign teachers? Are you willing to just have an open conversation and a dialogue and, and just be open to the fact that maybe we ought to be doing school radically differently? 
and each in their own way looked me in the eye and said, absolutely. We are willing to try to do some things differently. You know, Mike this morning talked about leadership of the head, leadership of the heart, and sometimes there's just this leadership of the gut. I don't know about you, but as a dad, I go back to this whole idea of, of school and what it looks like in this country. And I have to ask myself the question, are we moving at a pace in terms of our change and moving with the cheese a little slower than, than the rest of the segments of our world? So anyway, 11 years later, some, some pretty big things have happened in the Hall County School District. We went to all these traditional neighborhood schools, and all of a sudden now we have 25 charter schools that we run and programs of choice and magnet schools. Parents have the opportunity to say, I've got a five-year-old who seems to love the arts. She's already playing the violin, and I really want her to be able to go to school and continue to pursue her interest in the arts. Well, choose an arts elementary school. We may have another parent that says, well, I've got a sixth grader who's just fascinated by foreign languages and wants to learn different languages and is really fascinated in other cultures. Choose the World Language Academy. It's a natural choice for you. It has been a logistical challenge for some families, but I think it's pretty neat now that we have families who actually have three children, uh, one at the elementary, one at the middle, one at the high school, who have their kids in all different districts because the schools in those districts and their niche meets the God-given gifts and passions of their children better than the one that's in their backyard. Still have a lot of people that go to their neighborhood schools, 90%. But we have a lot of choices within our own district. 83% graduation rate, again, let's not compare with each other. I saw what yours was this morning. <laughs> it's actually closer to 84. But you have to remember, 11 years ago, ours was 67%. And in Georgia, we're the only school district in the nation our size that has three international baccalaureate diploma programs at the high school level. By the way, 90% of our middle school students, uh, our poor little middle school students, are earning anywhere between one and nine high school Carnegie units before they go on to high school. And some dramatic changes. By the way, when we, when we talk about school improvement, and I'm speaking to myself, I'm, a, I'm an educator. I'm really a farm boy that was misplaced, but, but I've, I've worked in education for a long time. When we start talking about school improvement levels of achievement, we get a little defensive, don't we? Some of us do. Because what we've gotten accustomed to in this past 15 years of believing that we can leave no child untested is that is that the superficial measure for a lot of us as to whether a school is a good school or a bad school. Isn't that silly to call a school good or bad? Let me suggest within every school there's some good things going on, there's some things that could be better, and there's a lot of stuff somewhere in the middle. And to just come out and start calling schools good or bad does not, does not do us any service. But in this, in this day and age, I was talking to my board president a little earlier, and just in the last 24 hours, uh, whenever I say I have a new idea, he just shakes his head and says, here we go again. Um, I said, it's come to me that the way that we talk about schools and school improvement is a lot about how we talk about our marriages. Getting a little personal here, but remember, I get to get on a plane and go home this afternoon. Because if I came out to this coffee bar this morning and had a half hour conversation with one of you, and all of a sudden out of the blue I said, how's your marriage? You got a pretty good marriage? Oh, wonderful. So do I. And I, and, I, and I thank the good Lord for that. But most of us would be, would be, it would be okay for us to think, it's really none of your business what my marriage is like. And you know what? When you start talking about our schools, and our school performance in schools that are full of all kinds of different children. And we start being so Pollyannish that what we want to do is take an average test score and start saying good school, bad school. Some of us get defensive. A third of us beat our chest and say, did you see where we were in the, in the rankings this week? And by the way, some of us that are beating our chest and saying how well our children are doing, if we broke it down and saw what kind of children are walking through those doors, we'd probably be a little quieter. 
And then some of us, and I'd like to think it's most of our school board members, most of our district administrators, are deep enough to know that that's a really poor comparison. So back to your marriage. If I said, your turn, how's your marriage? You know, you'd be very, you, you might say, none of your business. But if I said, you know what? My marriage over the last couple years has really gotten better. 23 years with this incredible woman whose name is Joy, and for the last couple years we've been doing some things, and I tell you, my marriage has never been better. It's just really improved. Most of us would say, tell me more about that. So when we compare our marriages to schools, whether our schools are underperforming, whether they're doing what the vast majority of schools in this country do, which is performing about where you'd expect them to perform based on the kids that are in the building, or whether they're overperforming, isn't the job of leadership, isn't the job of school boards and superintendents and PTO presidents and local community leaders to say, you know what, we're, we're doing okay, but let's ask the questions, how do we get better? And it really doesn't matter where our starting point is. So what I want to share with you is how we looked at a community and we started out by creating what I call and what John Cotter from Harvard University calls, we started out by creating an urgency for change. By the way, there's a handout on your table. That handout should serve as a takeaway and I hope some of you will go back and maybe at a board work session have the conversation about those three guiding questions on the left. Many of you probably already have. The vernacular may be a little different but what rich discussions. It's, it's good to see boards that have conversations that involve questions like those three on the left instead of deciding uh, where we're gonna buy uh, bus tires um, and, and, and having those meaningful discussions. But one of the conversations that, that we had, and again, it came from, from the gut, and I would ask you today, I don't care if you're in Iowa, or Cupertino, California, or Bozeman, Montana, or Gainesville, Georgia. The question I'd ask you is, does the education delivery that you're providing in your community look an awful lot like the education that you received? I don't know about you, but for me, the answer everywhere I've been is overwhelmingly yes. I've got an incredible and close relationship with my 83-year-old father and my 79-year-old mother. And when I talk to them about the education that they received in northern Wisconsin 60 and 70 years ago, and they describe what it looked like and what their teachers were like and how the time was used and what the day in the calendar looked like, the education that we're delivering in this country still looks an awful lot like the education that my parents received. My grandmother was born in 1905, taught in the rural Wisconsin schools for 40 years, and I used to love and sit and listen to my grandmother tell stories. But the stories that she tells about what happened in school and what school looked like back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s is eerily similar to the way that we have school and that school looks in the year 2015. Now I'm getting a little personal here again, so some of you are bristling a little bit. Because every time I say that to a group, someone will come up and say, I'm just going to say it now so you don't have to. Someone will come up to me afterwards and say, what's the matter with that? School worked pretty well for me. And you know how I'd answer that? I'd say, you know what, there are certain things that schools ought to always do. Children need to be able to read and they need to be able to read well. And if they don't do it by the age of eight, we've got some major problems ahead. Children need to be able to manipulate numbers and numeracy and it needs to be automatic. By the end of middle school, kids ought to be able to manipulate fractions, decimals, and percents and go back and forth because we can talk all we want to about STEM and about calculus and about differential equations, but if you can't manipulate numbers, you can't do higher math. Children, whether they're in Boise, Idaho, or Des Moines, Iowa, ought to know about the United States Constitution. They ought to know what it means to be a citizen of this incredible country. But after I get beyond that list, there's an awful lot of time and an awful lot of flexibility where we could make some different choices. And we could start to take into account that we're teaching the children of light, that we're teaching the, the digital generation. And maybe school delivery ought to look a little different than it did when I went to school. Question number one is a wonderful opportunity for boards of education to sit around and have a conversation for 15 minutes. 
and I'll make you a bet it'll lead you down some new roads. Question number two. And by the way, please don't take question number two as me saying that we overfund education. We underfund education. If I could give every teacher in this country, if I could double their salary tomorrow, I'd do it. It is the most meaningful profession in this nation. But I can't. But that being said, I think it's important that we remember that we as communities, we as parents, we as the generation that goes before make an incredible investment in public education in some parts of the country much more than others. But on average, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but I'd, I'd just like to quantify it and look at it. Take a look at the second question up there. It's a 13-year commitment on the part of the child and on the part of the family. It is an expenditure, again, depending on where you live, in some parts of this country of $110,000, in other parts $180,000, but we spend about one hundred and fifty grand educating a child K-12. It's a big chunk of money. And a public education K-12 also represents about 10,000 contact hours with educational professionals. We are making a huge investment. We can debate another day whether we should be making more in public education in this country. But the question that's attached to that is, could we use some of those resources differently, more effectively? Even within, a school, even within one school building differently for some children that have a readiness to learn and, and other children. Is it possible to suggest that maybe some children in this country need 220 days of school? And maybe we could meet the needs of others in 150 with some blended learning opportunities and some opportunities outside of the school walls? Are we bold enough to even ask those questions? And the third one gets back to the gut question. Now, everybody in here is a board member, a school administrator, a parent, or a grandparent, or a community member. And I would ask you, are you satisfied? At your core, are you satisfied with the education that we're delivering for the next generation? Doesn't mean it's bad. Doesn't mean we don't do some great things. But are you satisfied with the level of education that we're providing? You know, a lot of times I talk to groups and people say, Will, you sound like you're critical of teachers. Not at all. Teachers are mission-minded. Some of the finest people that you're ever going to meet. They deserve and don't get our esteem. So I can be very supportive of educators. I can be very supportive of teachers and at the same time bring up some questions and have some criticisms of education at the same time. There's a difference. That bottom quote, by the way, I'm not an English teacher, I was a math teacher, um, but I do know a little Shakespeare. I wasn't all that crazy about it, but I know a little Shakespeare. That quote that sometimes it's the dogs that don't bark that provide the most powerful clues that change is necessary, that comes from a Shakespeare adventure story by Arthur Conan Doyle. I believe it was the adventure of Silver Blaze, where the racehorse was stolen. And of course, Sherlock decides who stole the horse and who committed the murder. And Watson says, Sherlock, I said, how did you decide that? He said, the dogs didn't even bark on the night that the horse was stolen. And he said, exactly. He said, that was the clue that told me that it had to be somebody that lived in the house. You may live in a community that the dogs aren't barking. You got a 93% graduation rate. Kids doing pretty well on the ACT. Principal's keeping the bathrooms clean. System principles being nice to the parents that drop off their kids. All is well. The dogs aren't barking. But that does not absolve us as board members and superintendents from asking the question, could education be more? Could we do it even better? Because I have to believe that in most cases the answer is absolutely. So where do we begin? Again, we talked about the fact that schools are a very complex organization. And there's almost an infinite number of areas that we can work in. One of, the next, one of the next discussions we had in Gainesville, Georgia, after we had a community and a school district and a board of education that believed that we were willing and needed to make some changes, is we said, we've got to choose a lever or two. We've got to choose one or two things that we're going to really focus on and try to make a difference in. And, and we need to carefully choose, because if we choose the right lever or two, they have the potential to be a catalyst and spill out and improve in a lot of other areas within the school building. 
You know, I threw a list up there for you as a Board of ed Education to say, what, are, what is our focus or two going to be? But you may have others. I don't know your community. I don't know your students. I don't know what the goals and the dreams that you have for the next generation are in your district. But I can tell you on that list for us, we very quickly came to the second one, and it was a level of engagement. And you might be saying, what in the world does he mean by level of engagement? Here's the opportunity you're going to have to talk to the people at your table, because I'm, I'm going to ask you a series of three questions, and you're going to talk with each other to come up with a percentage. Okay? By the way, this is Googleable. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm inventing it today research that you can find in a number of different places when it comes to these levels of engagement. At your tables, answer this question. If we ask kindergartners in this country, in an age-appropriate way, do you like school? And do you see relevance in what you do at school and what you want to do with the rest of your life? What percentage of kindergartners do you think will answer in the affirmative, yes? Talk to the people in the Come up with some percentages. All right, I'm not going to be able to take audience participation, but I already know what you've said. Most of you said a number between 90 and 100 percent. You know what? Kindergartners love school. Those of you that are district administrators, I'm going to let you in on one of my little trade secrets. For 17 years when I'm having a bad day, you know where you find me? In a kindergarten classroom. Man, I will go to a kindergarten classroom, and I will read them a story, and I'll roll around on the floor with them, and I'll hand them some candy, and the teachers are going, why did he choose my room? <laughs> and then I'll leave. But I'll leave having my spirit renewed and remembering why it is that we do this work. They are beautiful. They love school. Okay? Now, let's ratchet it up a few years. Think about your sixth grade classrooms in your school district. Sixth graders, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. Um, and if you went in and you asked sixth graders in this country the same question, age appropriate, and that would be, do you like school? And do you see any relevance in what we're doing here with school for five and a half, six, six and a half hours a day and what you want to do with the rest of your life? What percentage of sixth graders in this country would answer yes? Talk with your people at your table. What is it? All right, let's bring it back in. I can tell you right now, some of you old enough to remember Karnak the Magnificent. Uh, it was not a number between 90 and 100%. And the real number in this country is a number between 50 and 60%. About half of our sixth graders are still connecting some sort of dots and saying, I enjoy school. I see some relevance in what I'm doing. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? Yes, I like school. All right, you know how the story ends. Let's take it up another three years. Let's get to our ninth graders, our high school freshmen in this country. And by the way, one of the dirty little secrets we don't like to talk much about is about 15% of our kids are gone before they ever get to ninth grade. They don't make it to ninth grade. But for those that are left, if you asked, and this is not an Iowa question, it could be a Wisconsin question or a Mississippi question, the numbers come back very similar. But if you asked our ninth graders in American high schools, number one, do you like school? And you see a lot of relevance between what we're doing with you five and a half, six hours a day and what you want to do with the rest of your life. What percentage of ninth graders in this country do you think answer yes? Talk about it at your table. All right, once again, not going to be able to get audience participation, but don't, don't throw things at me. Again, in Shakespearean times, the groundlings would throw fruit at the performers if they didn't like what they were doing and didn't like. So please don't throw fruit. But it's, between, it's a number between 20 and 25 percent. About a quarter of our high school kids in this country are saying, 
I'm not that crazy about school, and I'm not seeing much relevance in what you're asking me to do. I just want to endure this experience. I want to get it over with. I want to get my diploma and move on to something I want to do. Ladies and gentlemen, as a third takeaway, may I suggest that that's unacceptable? May I suggest that our kids over the last two, three generations haven't gotten bad or apathetic or uncaring? And again, you have to realize I'm talking to myself. May I suggest that I haven't done what I need to do to create an environment and a culture within my high schools in Hall County, Georgia, that makes kids excited about coming to school and what they're going to learn. Not, not hard, hard work and learning isn't always fun, but it can be engaging. And that's the lever that we chose. It was these levels of engagement. How many of you are familiar with Sir Ken Robinson? Ken Robinson seems to really get it when it comes to this idea of school engagement. And if you would, watch this 60-second video of Ken talking about the issue that's not an American issue, it's an international issue and a crisis when it comes to talking about what schools ought to look like. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which was if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. By the way, what I've done with you with this audience is what we tried to do with an entire community over a period of a year or two. I've tried to create a sense of urgency if it doesn't already exist that perhaps there's some things we should be courageous enough and willing enough to look at in terms of change within our schools. I'll be honest with you, I know what it looks like and the first thing you also need to hear Nathan and I say is, I'm not saying we did it right. This is something that we put a lot of thought and a lot of prayer into and we decided that it was important and in our community it was the road that we were going to take. But I will be the first to admit that we, we may be wrong. I don't think so, looking at a decade of results. But I'm not standing here saying we have any secret answers. As Emerson said, we don't know, we just want to find out. We just asked the questions. So we built this urgency. We decided it was going to be level of engagement. And let me tell you what the next step was in the Hall County School District. And this really made educators uneasy. You know, I've told you I love educators, and generalizations are dangerous, but generalizations are also useful in terms of understanding what you can expect in terms of what's ahead of you. And if I got out of scale from 1 to 10, 1 being on the low end, 10 being fantastic, and I said, let's rate educators in terms uh, of their caring nature, teachers would blow it off the chart. Or up in the 9, 7, 9, 8, they'd be as, as high as any group you could come up with. They are a caring lot. But if I got out another 1 to 10 scale, and I said, now let's rate educators in terms of whether or not they're innovators, whether they're thoughtful risk takers, whether they're entrepreneurs, um, let's just be real honest. As educators, we're a fairly conservative lot. And we'd be down in that 2-3 range. We just don't like a lot of change. We don't like the idea of doing something different because you know what? I remind my teachers all the time, you have to remember, school worked for you. You went to school, you worked hard, you got good grades, but there's a lot of kids in your classroom that school doesn't work for. And they're coming to you with a different paradigm. 
And so the next thing that we did is we started going out and visiting our 33 schools, and, I, and I'd ask them this question. I'd say, what do you like about what you're doing in your school right now? Tell me the good things. And man, they'd fill up pages of things that they were doing well. I said, all right. Now I said, tell me some of the things that if you were queen for the day, king for the day, tell me some things that you'd change about your schools. And boy, they were a little quiet at first, but once they realized I wasn't out to get them, that I really wanted to hear, the information started to flow. Well, if we'd just do this, that would sure help me as a teacher. And if I didn't have to do this and could spend my time, this would sure help me as a teacher. And we came up as we endorsed over the last 10 years, by the way, about 700 teachers with a gifted endorsement in those strategies that ought to be used in every classroom. We came up with a capstone project for those individuals getting that gifted endorsement and threw the challenge out to every one of our schools, dream your dream school. And we said, what could your school be challenge? And we knew educators liking to have some sort of structure, not just always being the most innovative of thinkers, that what we'd have to do is give them a little structure. I said, and here's your structure for dreaming your dream school. And it's up there, right there. Number one, what we're looking for is more student engagement. We want kids to be excited about coming to school. In Hall County, we call it the dinner table test. I know the ACT is important. I know the NAEP is important. But there's a test that we call the dinner table test. And that is when mom and dad, aunt and uncle, grandpa and grandma, when you're sitting around the dinner table at night and your fourth grader looks at you and says, Dad, you wouldn't believe what we did in science class today. And I can't wait to get back and do it again tomorrow. We said we want to increase levels of engagement. We want to pass the dinner table test but it has to be research-based. So bring us your ideas, schools, bring us your ideas. Second thing is we said you gotta have the overwhelming support of your faculty and your community. We're not gonna run down a road and try to do something that parents don't understand, that teachers haven't bought into, and that the people that have to carry out the change at your school aren't a part of. You've gotta have overwhelming support. The next one they didn't like, I think, Iowa was similar to Georgia, and if I remember right, back in 2009, 2010, I think in the middle of the year, you guys got a 10% cut in your funding. One of the worst days I'll remember for the rest of my life is when I told 128 effective teachers, you don't have a job next year. We're downsizing, we've got to cut $20 million out of our budget in the Hall County School District. So another thing to remember is that while we had all this innovation springing up in these programs of choice and challenge within the Hall County School District, revenues were plummeting. So in, in this sense, it really kind of worked to my benefit because I told folks, if your idea requires another million bucks, if your way of having school takes another 600, please don't even bother coming. I don't, there's, no, there's no secret sack of money in the back somewhere that I'm hiding. Uh, we've got all the money that we're gonna have. What you can do, is spend your money differently. And you know what? All of a sudden, as they dreamed their dream schools and started creating these magnet schools, we'd have, listen to this, we'd have, we'd have groups of teachers come to us from a school and say, currently we have five fourth grade teachers, we only want four. I'm like, wow. And we wanna take that money and buy technology specialists who can design blended lessons and create digital resources for kids and teachers and parents. Uh, that's how we wanna use that salary, go forth. Wonderful idea. And the list could go on. We could talk about those forever. And the final is one in the Hall County School District that we affectionately call the orange coverall test. You know, Mike told us this morning that great leaders know when to bend and break the rules. I'll go for the bend part. But that whole breaking federal law or breaking state law, I tell my people all the time, I said, you know what? I'm way too old to wear orange coveralls and go to jail. And if you do something out at your school that causes me to go to jail, you're going with me. They make those coveralls in all kinds of sizes and we'll do it together. And so we're gonna follow the law, we're gonna try to, we bend the rules all the time, we try not to break them. So that was it. And so what's happened over the last 10 years? Um, we now have these 25 programs of choice and let me encourage you not to go to our website, hallco.org, write down these and say, oh man, I'm gonna go back home and create a multiple intelligences academy. What works in one of our communities with our group of students and our group of teachers and our group of leaders and, and what the expectations are for our community may very well not work in yours. Please don't buy into somebody's snake oil that says, just do it like we do and your schools will be better. 
But if you want to go to our website, you can see on here, these are the 25 programs of choice that have been created in our school district over the last 10 years. And we've also seen tremendous increases in parent and community satisfaction with our local schools. It's been a powerful tool for school improvement in the Hall County School District. Don't have time to talk to you about Catalyst Schools, but on the handout, the other thing that I would ask you to do, you can take advantage of the mistakes that we made. And in the deeper dive session this afternoon, we're going to talk about the characteristics, because now what we have the opportunity to do is we're looking backwards at all of our programs of choice, and we're asking the question, the programs that have been most successful, what have been the common elements? And I'll go through them very quickly here. There's been a catalyst. We've been able to identify why we wanted to make a change in the first place. There's been r radical increases in levels of student and teacher engagement. Folks actually enjoy going to school. We have leadership champions. You know, Iowa, I see you have this um, teacher leader compensation, T TLC. It was very impressive. Um, but as I look through the characteristics, one of the things I'd suggest is another thing we look for in leaders is those evangelists. Those people that not only know what it looks like, those people that not only can come in and do a model lesson, but that will be going around and what they do will spread amongst their peers. Who are your innovators? Who are your teacher leaders and champions? Our programs that have been successful in the last 10 years have had those leadership champions put in the right place and they've been supported. Collaboration. We see parents and businesses and community that's participating in their schools, and we've already talked about resources. These schools are using their resources, the same amount of resources, and they're using them differently. Finally, I've talked to a number of you who also, you know, some in terms of classroom pedagogy, uh, we expect to see authentic intellectual work in our classrooms, whether it's a kindergarten or whether it's an AP physics class. And a number of you are already familiar with the work of Fred Newman from the University of Wisconsin, what authentic intellectual work, what that lens looks like, and I would encourage you to explore something like that, but have a pedagogical lens and expectations for your classroom practice. Curriculum, we see an awful lot of integration in our uh, successful programs. We don't have silos of math and silos of science and silos of English. Uh, those schools and those teachers have done a wonderful job of integrating. And technology is last on my list for a reason. We have spent billions in this country putting technology into classrooms, and it is a valuable tool. But we do not apologize for the fact that we tell our principals, we tell our teachers, we tell our students, it is a tool for producing, for active learning. It should not be a tool for consumption. Kids sitting around and surfing the internet and playing games and Instagramming each other are not learning uh, skills that are going to help them in the 21st century. Technology is important. Technology needs to be used effectively. So final thing. So how's this working out for you? Let me just give you a quick snapshot of our school district over the last 10 years. Continuing to grow. Picked up about 3,500 kids. After the great meltdown in 2008, we had three years where we grew none. But we're picking up again. Getting poor, about two-thirds of our kids. That just went up 3%. I got the report for this year, yesterday. Got an awful lot of kids don't speak the English language. Not good, bad, or indifferent. It's just the facts, man. We love them. They're wonderful kids. So how your kids been achieving in the Hall County School District the last 10 years? Uh, we're graduating a lot more kids. Our student uh, population has grown by 15%. Our number of graduates has grown by 50% which translates in, I know, there you go again, that's only 84, that's not all that great. But it was great for us, and it represented a huge improvement, up to 84%. Number of students at the high school level taking AP and IB, 1,748 students in our school district. Number of middle school students taking high school level courses, 2,200. Number of middle school students earning, number of Carnegie units awarded, almost 5,000 in our district last year. By the way, it does two things. Students who are going to struggle graduating, it gives them a head start. Students who want to go to Duke and be a neurosurgeon create some wonderful space in their junior and senior year to do some other things uh, their last couple years with us. So what we're doing is we're striving to be the most caring place on earth. So I leave you with this challenge. What's your role going to be? What are you going to do? And, and please don't take this as a criticism. So many of you are probably already doing it and could teach, teach us so much about what you're doing in your districts. 
But regardless of how good you are, regardless of your graduation rates, regardless of how good your kids are, isn't it always possible that we could get a little better? And aren't the stakes high enough that we ought to be asking those questions? Take a look at this one minute video clip from a gentleman who lived during the days of Gettysburg, a gentleman named Charles Blondine. Charles Blondine, he was one of the greatest tightrope walkers in the history of the world. And one of his greatest feats was walking the, the Niagara Falls on a tightrope, 11,000 feet long, 160 feet above the water. And this he accomplished a number of times and, and always with different theatric variations. Blindfolded, in a sack, pushing a wheelbarrow, on stilts, carrying a man on his back, and sitting down one time midway while he made and ate an omelet. And one day after he had pushed a wheelbarrow across the, the Niagara Falls and come back on that tightrope, he asked a question. How many of you believe that I could put a person in this wheelbarrow and push him across the tightrope? And everybody cheered and yelled and screamed and everybody believed. And then he asked for a volunteer. <laughs> And the crowd grew very, very quiet until one man stepped out of the crowd and got in the wheelbarrow. There's a difference between the crowd and the man in the wheelbarrow. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? What you do matters. You make a difference in the lives of millions of boys and girls, you and our collective brothers and sisters that work in the field of education. And at the end of our days, we'll have to somehow measure our significance. And I can't say it any better than, than Emerson said it. And let me suggest that perhaps one way we'd measure our significance is to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of our honest critics and then to endure the betrayal of our false friends, to appreciate beauty, to see the best in others, and to leave this world that we're living in a better place, whether it's with a healthy child, a garden patch, or redeeming a social condition. But board members, administrators, Emerson said that at the end of each day, have we done those things that allow at least one to breathe easier because we have lived? Then we have significance. God bless you for what you do. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for what you do for the boys and girls of Iowa.